Uh, I guess I don't need to introduce John too much. Uh, you know, he was actually the one who started this uh, series of talks here at eHarmony. Uh, it was in 2011 in March when it was it was actually like a mini conference run, uh, like a single one man show, uh, where John gave like it was like three consecutive talks, a tutorial on Oracle at that time. I think it was version 5.1 and then uh, two more talks. Um, so John is an alumni of Caltech uh, here, and also alumni of Carnegie Mellon. He worked at Toyota Technological Institute, IBM Watson Research, uh, Yahoo Research, and uh, re uh, quite recently now he has joined Microsoft Research. And uh, I mean, uh, he has contributed to a very wide area of machine learning research, including CAPTCHAs, for example. But uh, the thing, the, the, he gave the world one amazing thing, which is Warpal Guabi, the uh, record-breaking machine learning tool. And uh, as you might have heard, he has a new version out, uh, version 7.0. And uh, he will tell you how this thing can solve all your problems, all your machine learning problems. So <laughs> I'm really looking forward to that. Please welcome John Lankor. I don't think I can actually tell you how to solve all your problems. It's a little bit too ambitious. But, but I can tell you about some, some cool new things. Uh, and, and maybe that's interesting. Um, so the story of the transition from Yahoo Research to Microsoft Research is also very interesting. But uh, yeah, so I, I guess on, on March 4th, Prabhupada Raghavan quit. And, uh, and that was pretty traumatic because he was sort of the, he was the head of Yahoo Research. And uh, and he would never actually quit unless something bad was going to happen. So we were like, hmm, what do we do? We managed to work something out. OK, so uh, in 1997, uh, I'm going to talk about two things. One of them was actually uh, all reduced, which is related to parallelism, which is why we have version 6.0. We're going to talk about learning reductions, which is why we have a 7.0. Um, so in 1987, when I was graduating from Caltech, I applied for a fellowship for graduate study, and uh, I think it was something like the Hertz Fellowship. And I had somebody come to interview me um, on campus. He said, uh, "What do you want to do?" And I said, "I'd like to solve AI." And he said, "How?" And he said, "I was going to use parallel learning." Right? And uh, he said. <laughs> approximately. <laughs> <laughs> so that was that was very basic. Um, not the kind of well, not the kind of way you want an interview to go. Um, <laughs> didn't get the fellowship as you expect. Um, and and the thing which was funny here is that that was actually true. Uh, so in 1997, parallel machine learning didn't make sense. Because every, every attempt to do parallel machine learning was surpassed by single machine learning algorithms. And in general, uh, you should there's a lot of other parallel machine learning work out there, and you should uh, you should think about it pretty carefully because often they kind of compare with a stupid learning algorithm, and then you're like, mm, uh, I'm not sure this makes so much sense. So. Um, I want to show you an example. So I think I showed this last time, but I have a slightly modified version, which maybe shows off the BW can do a little bit better. Um, so this is the RCV1 data set. Uh, so in general, one of the ways that BW is kind of interesting is that we, we try to figure out how to take as raw data as possible. <coughs> right? So if, you, if you're used to RCV1 from other places, um, what you might look at is this one here. So this is, so here the category is CCAT or not, so that the label is one or minus one. And then you have a feature, and which is, corresponds to a word. Um, so you, you run all of your vocabulary past the dictionary. 
you're, you're in your vocabulary by the dictionary, and then you, you get an index for each word, and then you get a, you, you do use a TF-ID transform to get the uh, actual value of the feature. Okay, so instead, what you can do in VW is just feed in the raw words. So here are the individual words. Uh, they're going to have a default feature value of one for the words which are present and zero for the ones which are not present. And, and you have, uh, you know, in, in the categories you get, but not if they're individual items. Okay, so the effect of this is that you can just go like this. So this is optimizing square blocks. And this is, this is pretty decent. It turns out that you can do it a little bit better um, by adding in some extra flags, like ingrams and skipgrams. Um, and so now the number of features, for example, is up, so you can see more. And you know, in a few seconds, we're getting a predictor now, which is uh, substantially better than anything else you can get on a state of the uh, <clears throat> So the point is that you can feed in very raw data, the VW, and it still does quite well um, around the best possible performance. In general, when you just have, when you're comparing a linear predictor to a linear predictor, the, the performance that you get is pretty similar unless they have very different optimization approaches. In VW, the optimization approach tends to be based around online learning by default. So online learning with square loss um, by default. And then that means that we, we, we just use that default because it's very fast. And then the prediction performance that we can get with this approach is near to the art. And then of course, because things are very fast, you can iterate and you can screw around with with different uh, learning rates or different uh, numbers of ingrams or, or skip frames. Uh, and that means that you can, you can develop uh, a, a good predictor uh, much faster than you might otherwise be able to do. So if you look at this, there are it's three, three, 343 negative features, uh, which is the, the number of non-zero entries in the data matrix. <coughs> okay, so that's, that's, that's just single machine VW, and that's, it's going pretty fast. Um, we can train in about three seconds or so. Uh, if you don't throw in the ingrams and skip grams, you do have 60 mega features. Uh, and you, you can learn this, this predictor from the raw data. And then, uh, you know, things work pretty well. But now we want to make things go faster. Right. So let's say we have a 2 point <coughs> pair of feature data set. So this is the number of non-zero entries in the data matrix. Right, so Terror is great because it's like terror, right? So, uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> and now the question is, how do we learn a good linear predictor? And that's it's, uh, I can tell you some more details about this. Data. This was a uh, predictor probability of quick type of data set where you had a whole bunch of interaction data. There were 17 billion examples. We were trying to learn some of 16 million parameters, and we had a 1,000 node cluster available. Right? And it's, it's the 1,000 node cluster which makes it this parallel thing to do. But still, it's not trivial to figure out how to use this cluster best. I should say that if you have questions, you should uh, feel free to ask them. Oh, yeah. It's kind of a very VW-centered question. Yeah. Is there any way to run engrams over specific feature spaces? There are, it's not at the moment, but that is obviously a, a useful thing to have. It's also pretty easy to match putting it in because it's just a matter of the data changing the interface. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so now how long does it take to actually learn uh, on this? <coughs> Uh, 
Any guesses? <coughs> it's more like a million times bigger than our first data because uh, we're going from 60 mega features to 2.1 tera. So that's the five orders of magnitude on the data. So two orders of magnitude worse than three seconds would be three hundred seconds. So that would be like five minutes. That'd be great. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. <laughs> so so it ends up being in seventy minutes. Okay, so this is this is a bit worse than, than uh, five minutes, but uh, but this is still if, if you just take the, the number of features and you divide by the time, it's five hundred mega features per second, and each individual machine in this cluster had just a gigabit uh, network card, and you you can't shove five hundred mega features through a gigabit Ethernet card um, in a second. So uh, we're actually training faster than the I/O bandwidth of any machine in the cluster. Okay, so now this is the answer to the guy um, at, at Caltech, right? Because there is no future single machine learning algorithm which will be able to succeed faster than VW did here. This is a proof that, uh, that the parallel learning is actually working uh, faster than. I mean, we're, we're doing something completely non-trivial here because you just can't do it uh, with a single machine. You have to shove the data through the network interface. Uh, it doesn't just materialize, materialize out of nowhere. And that means that, uh, that the training time on a single machine must be larger for any future algorithm. <coughs> okay, and this is, this is the only example I know of where this is uh, known to be true. Why do you need to go through the network interface for a single machine? So if you want to train with some data, you need to, you need to, the data in the model need to interact. So if, if the model's on a single machine, the data must go through the network interface. So, uh, so what you're thinking about is a situation where you have like a Hadoop cluster, and the data is already sitting on the machine, and then so you just move your uh, your, your, your program to the, uh, the node from the data. But uh, still, the data had to actually move to that machine at the beginning. Right? So it's always the case that the data had to move onto the machine at the beginning. Okay, so I'm going to describe how to do this, and then we'll discuss some learning reduction stuff as well. Um, so the, the one thing which is necessary but not sufficient to get a good um, learning algorithm is, is, a, is a fast communication structure. And uh, Hadoop, um, what we're actually doing is on Hadoop, but Hadoop is kind of a dog um, in terms of the dog in several ways, but it's a dog in terms of the speed of communication between nodes. Um, so we wrote our own communication infrastructure, which is built into VW now. Um, first thing we try to do is try to use MPI, but MPI and Hadoop don't play well together. Um, but then there is an operation in MPI which is very helpful, as it's all reduced. Um, and I'll show you how the operation works. So initially you have seven nodes, let's say. And now you want to um, you want to be able to do all reduce on them. So what you do is you wire them. Or you want to be able to do all reduce. So what happens with all reduce is you have a number on each of these nodes. That's that's the beginning state. And the end state is you have the sum of all numbers on all nodes. So this is a, this is essentially a synchronization operation. Um, so so this, this is the definition of all reduce right here. And so. You have different numbers of different nodes, and then you have the sum of all numbers on all nodes. Now the question is just how do you do this? 
<laughs> and, and the answer is that you wire things up into a tree. And then you start at the leaves going towards the root, uh, adding things up, right? So three plus four plus six is uh, 13. And then eight plus 13 plus seven is 28. And now you have the sum of all numbers at the top. And then you, you broadcast them back down through the tree. Okay, so there's several things which are extremely nice about this. And um, for applications where, um, where your learning model fits onto a single machine, I think all reduce is something you should really think about if you, if you want to try to parallelize machine learning. Uh, so several things which are pretty cool. So um, typically, you, you're running all reduce not on a single number, but rather on a vector of numbers, like all the like a, a, a bunch of gradients, about one for each dimension, or a bunch of parameters, one for each dimension. Right. So, when you're doing this, um, so you, you don't want to pay a latency for every single operation. So what you can do is you can pipeline. So you, you sh you're, you're pushing the first number up the tree while the last number still hasn't moved at all. Right. And you, so you can pipeline things. And then the, the running time is going to be um, dependent upon the bandwidth, but not on the latency between those, as long as your vectors are long. Okay. okay, so we can pipeline the process of doing all reduce so that there is no latency. Concern. And then uh, the bandwidth required is, is just a constant factor worse than the best you can possibly imagine. So the, the worst case is for an internal node, because if you have a number coming in and a number coming in, a number going out, a number coming back, and two numbers going out. So your communication is six times the, the uh, minimum complexity. Um, in fact, you can think once you actually end up being two, and there's a slightly better way to do this to give you down to two, but we haven't done that yet. <coughs> the last point was incredibly important. Um, so in BW, code in the, in the main program, in, in the sequential program that I just showed you, to do this is about 14 lines, right? Uh, and that's it's fantastically helpful. So an alternative which people have tried and which can kind of work, particularly for linear prediction, is using repeated MapReduce, right? And, but when you do repeated MapReduce, what happens is the, the parallel primitive um, forces you to refactor your code. Um, so you need to write the map job and the reduce job, and then you need to glue everything together so you can do repeated map reduce. Um, when, you, when you're doing all reduce, there's no, there's no need to break your code up into map and reduce. You can just, uh, you can just run your code on each individual node, and then at, at appropriate points in the code, you can just say all reduce. And that uh, that makes things work in parallel. Okay, so this is this is extremely helpful in many situations. Um, I guess the reason why I'm emphasizing this is that I screwed around with a lot of other kind of parallel learning before I played with Alrdis, and it was extremely painful, and didn't work nearly as well. Uh, here's an example uh, of using Alrdis. So. When you're doing online learning, you can pass through all of your examples. So you can pass through all of your examples doing an online update after each individual uh, example is seen. And then when you get to the end, you can call all reduce on the weights. And then you can average the weights. And then you can start another pass. So, and, and this just gives you repeated passes over the data where you're doing online learning in each pass. So it, it's easy to do this. Uh, we also used all reduce to do non-uniform averaging. Um, it requ requires two all reduce calls. Uh, you can do conjugate gradient. Um, you can do LBFTS. So the LBFTS and conjugate gradient, th these are sort of more advanced learning algorithms of one sort or another. And it, it's very important if you're doing parallel learning that you're using these advanced learning algorithms because otherwise you're speeding up the slow algorithms and you're doing nothing. 
<clears throat> Who has actually seen LBFGS before? Okay, so uh, LBFGS is one of these miraculous algorithms that was made in, well, the BFGS was in 1970 and LBFGS was in 1980. Uh, the core idea of LBFGS is that you approximate the inverse Hessian um, directly. And uh, it's one of these algorithms where you need to write about this much code um, very carefully, because if you make a mistake, it won't work, and you'll have no idea why. So uh, it's the kind of code which you would really <coughs> not like to touch when you're trying to realize things. OK, so, um, so we, did, we, we made this already system. And, but we weren't, the, the data typically lives at Yahoo, it lived in Hadoop. And now the question is, how do we actually get things to run in a Hadoop environment? Uh, and there are, as I said before, Hadoop is kind of a dog in some ways, but it, it does some things very well. Uh, one thing that it does is it moves your program to your data. And uh, your program might be 10 megabytes, and your data might be a terabyte or a gigabyte at least. It's 10 gigabytes on a single node. Uh, so the ability to move the program to the data is, is very helpful in terms of the efficiency of the overall system. Okay. Um, another thing that you can do, um, so in general, when you're using all reduce, it's not as reliable as map reduce, right? and, and that's kind of necessarily true because the, the, the magic of all reduce is that you're doing direct network communication. And that means you're not saving the network communication on disk. So it's not slow, but it can fail, right? So now you want to worry about uh, failure modes. You want, to, you want to think about how often is this going to fail in practice when I'm running on a real Hadoop cluster. And we, we have two tricks to try to uh, reduce the failure modes, which are taking advantage of some of the robustness which is built into Hadoop. Um, one of these tricks is delayed initialization. So, uh, when machines fail in a cluster, often what's failing is the disk. And, and if you run through all of your data, let's just go back a little bit. So if you run through all of your data right here, before you uh, start your communication infrastructure for all reduce, then, uh, then the disk failures can happen before you create a communication infrastructure. And when that happens, Hadoop automatically restarts the same job on a different node in the same data. Right? And so the, the creation of the communication infrastructure becomes transparent uh, with respect to these kinds of failures. Right? So the, these kinds of failures don't interrupt the process of the job because um, by the time the, the communication infrastructure is established, all of these failures have been moved, moved out of the system. So in the first pass through the data, we first read and cache all the data in a binary format. And then we create uh, the all reduced communication infrastructure. Okay, so that's, that's important. Another thing which comes up is that if you have a thousand machines, it's very common that one of the machines is going to be slow. Uh, and now because all reduce is a barrier operation, it's only going to run as fast as the slowest machine. So that, that's kind of a problem. Uh, it's a significant problem. Uh, it's, just, it's kind of a problem that's hard to quantify because when you have a, an empty cluster, maybe it's not such a bad problem. But if you have other people running other jobs, uh, which happen to be on the same node, or which happen to use the node the same, use the node with, so your data is sitting on a machine, their data is sitting on the same machine, now maybe they start up, and now you need to suck the data off to some other machine to run it on. Anyways, things can run substantially slower when you have these exogenous jobs. So, um, so Hadoop has a mechanism called speculative execution. So you, you can, uh, if a particular job is running slow, then you can restart the same job on a different node with the same data. 
And then you can race to see who finishes first. Right. And whichever one finishes first is the one which actually gets used. So maybe maybe you use 30% uh, more machines, but maybe things run a factor of 10 faster. So the, the, we set up all reduced work and take advantage of the execution. And in practice, this gave us a factor of 10 improvement on speed when we were looking at a thousand node job. How much slower is the slowest machine than the, the, the average? You know? um, so it, it depends a lot on how many machines you're using simultaneously. And it also depends a lot on, on exactly what the external load is. Uh, for the clusters that we were working with, we could see the slowest machine be a factor of 20 or 30 slower than the fastest machine. And see what it did. Uh, speculative execution brought that down to a factor of three, or two or three, essentially, yeah. slower, um, which, which was tolerable. Speculative execution looks at the busyness of the cluster, but it doesn't necessarily take into account the slowness that might be innate due to a slower disk or something of that nature, right? So, speculative execution is something is works on sort of a node by node basis, <coughs> and it just says, oh, is this job each job is consuming data, and if a job is consuming data particularly slowly, then it will restart that job. Um, the same data on Right, but it doesn't necessarily know that a node has lesser hardware or fewer resources. It doesn't know that, that but it, 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 it takes that in, I mean, it doesn't know that explicitly, but if, if it notices that the job is running slowly, then it will get restarted somewhere else. Okay. Most of these clusters, in fact, are homogenous though in hardware, because they're, they're bought all at once. <coughs> yeah. So speculative brings up the idea of um, running the same job twice and seeing who wins and just cancel it rather than monitoring, detecting failure, and restarting, which is basically not effective. Yes, yeah, so we, we have to be a little bit <coughs> careful about what we call a job. So um, I haven't been careful about this. So uh, you have an overall job, you have a global job, which is decomposed into a bunch of local jobs. Suspective execution is working at the local job level. Uh, is that what you meant by job? I guess I'm wondering about the use of the word speculative. Yeah. Rather than restart a local job, which is not speculative. You're not running two local jobs on the same data, expecting some percentage to fail or run slow and then cancel the other one. So abundant CPU means you can schedule extra on the same job and see who wins. That's speculative. I see. So I, I guess I'm used to speculative previously in, from branch prediction in um, CPUs. We speculatively execute something, assuming that if it's going to be true or false. And then uh, if that's not true, then you roll back. Um, so that's a little bit different from what we're doing here because we, we kind of we do the same thing, but just at different speeds, and whichever one goes fastest is the one that we keep. But you don't always run two jobs. It's like if it notices it is taking longer than it's on the average. So um, we always run two jobs. Yeah, it's for all my Yeah. So Hadoop is kind of not very good at this. Um, so you don't actually always run two jobs. But all that you really need is to run like 5% more jobs. Uh, but on the other hand, Hadoop. Um, might run 30% more, 35% more, more jobs, depending upon exactly what the load in the cluster is. It, it kind of does what it wants to do here, and it's not exactly what you would want it to do. You um, haven't screwed with that new schedule for Okay, so this is, <clears throat> so we made this all reduced to be compatible with the do. However, it still runs on an individual cluster. So if you have your own individual cluster, you can still partition your data across individual nodes, and you can script to start things up and, and that will work too. Um, 
All right, so now, uh, okay, so maybe we get a reliable execution of about 3,000 node hours with, this, with all these strings. Uh, so the job that I told you in the beginning was about 1,000 node hours. When we were comparing with other uh, systems, often they were much slower, and so we, we went out to as much as 40,000 node hours for one. But I think around 10,000 is where it starts to become unreliable. So maybe you have to restart the global job. Um, so it costs a fraction of the time, one quarter of the time at, at 10,000 node hours. It becomes appreciable that you start to notice it. All right, so now uh, I'm gonna just describe the learning algorithm because the communication and the, and the robustness are sort of necessary but not sufficient to get like, good performance. Um, so the, the key thing that you want to do is minimize the number of iterations through small algorithms. And so we, we could easily have a dumb algorithm that needed to go over the data many times in order to get to a good solution. But we want to try to minimize that as hard as we can. So uh, we have our online learning uh, rule. And uh, many people are familiar with Sugetsu gradient descent, right? Um, so this is kind of very tricked up stochastic gradient descent because we have normalized updates that are adaptive in each dimension and they're safe so that you can't overshoot the individual label and they deal with large importance weights and, and then there's just online gradient descent. Right? So we have a bunch of extra adjectives. Um, or you can go into detail, can't be valuable. I wasn't planning to go into detail on these. Um, so th there are, so in version seven, this was redone, but the previous presentations um, on the website discuss adaptive and safe in detail. So you can take a look there to see what's going on. <coughs> and hopefully we'll have the new normalized version described in greater detail reasonably soon. You also want to use, so online gradient descent approaches are pretty good at getting you to a, a good solution very quickly. Not necessarily the best at getting you to a, a, a perfect solution um, because, because they're just doing looking at examples one at a time. So it's hard for them to average properly. LDFGS is uh, pretty crappy at getting you somewhere fast. But once you get to the, the, the neighborhood of where you want to be, it's very good at giving you a high precision solution. So we used a pass from one to warm start two. And, and that seemed to be a, a very effective approach. So th this, would, uh, this would allow us, um, I mean, sometimes that wasn't required because online we just nail things. But for some data sets, switching from the uh, online to the LDFGS was extremely helpful. Get a question. Uh, I was just wondering whether you found that the FGS converged more reliably than something like Lindenberg Marquardt once you were actually in the appropriate neighborhood. I haven't experimented with uh, Lindenberg Marquardt, um, so I, I can't really say. LBFGS we did find was pretty reliable for for the kinds of optimizations that we were doing, which is essentially linear with the convex loss function. Yeah. So uh, how do you decide when to make the transition? <clears throat> yeah, so we fooled around with it for a while, and the conclusion at the end was that you do one pass of online, and then you switch to LBFGS. I'll show you an experiment in a minute. Okay, so now um, you use a map only Hadoop job for process control and error recovery. You use all reduced code to synchronize the state. Um, you always save, so, so we're using a Hadoop map only streaming job to feed us the examples in a text format. And then we save them into a binary format in a cache file. So that when we need to pass over the data again, it's much, much faster. Um, let, me, let me comment on this real quick. A lot of people have noticed that um, Learning algorithms don't work very well in a MapReduce type cluster. And a lot of people have proposed sort of iterative versions of MapReduce or iterative versions of, of these clusters like uh, 
There's a spark system in Berkeley, for example. <clears throat> Often what these systems do is they try to cache the data into memory. And when you cache the data into memory, your access to the data is faster. But your system overall becomes less powerful because you can't deal with as much data. So right now, for, for this, for the particular example I was showing, we only needed 64 megabytes for the model, which meant that when we were doing LBFCS, we only needed a gigabyte or less for, for the actual state of the low learning system. But um, there's plenty of other applications where you'd want to have many more parameters. And then you start getting into this trade-off where you, if you need to fit your data into memory uh, and your model into memory, then you can't do nearly as good as just fitting your model into memory. Often the amount of data is substantially larger than the size of the model. And, and that means that the, the scale that you can really approach is, uh, is reduced if you're catching a lot of data. Okay, um, we used the hashing trick to reduce input complexity. Uh, I, I discussed hashing trick last time I was here. Um, does anybody want me to describe the hashing trick? No? It's very handy, extremely useful. Uh, it, it makes the number of parameters in your system be fixed in the of your data set. Right? And that's, uh, that's a very helpful in terms of having predictable um, execution. Okay, so this is open source. Um, and, and, and this is essentially what made things work. Okay, so now I'm going to show you some experiments, um, which just kind of analyze the system in various ways. <clears throat> so the first thing that you worry about is uh, sort of the reliability. And it, it's kind of hard to do experiments here because uh, one of the things that makes your system unreliable is if, 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 if there's other jobs running. And by definition, you don't really control the other jobs. Uh, so what we did was we took a smaller data set and we cut it up into different size chunks and we used different numbers of nodes when we were learning. So it was 180, uh, 60, 40, 30, 20, and 10. So running down here was about almost a factor of 10 slower than running up here. And so you can see how the experiments become a little bit difficult because you want to have enough data so that the time required is not trivial. So you actually justify using a cluster. Uh, but on the hand, if you just have a, a factor of 10 difference in the number of nodes, execution time down here becomes a factor of 10 larger, or about a factor of 10 larger. Okay, so then at each number of nodes, we ran um, the same job 10 times. And then you can look at um, the average performance, which is what the red line is. And you can think about a speed up curve, how much speed up are we getting with different numbers of nodes. And the speed up is not perfectly linear. Um, in general, when you have the really good algorithms, you try to parallelize them, you don't expect to have perfect linear speed up. Uh, but it is, it's, it's fairly close to linear, that's nice. And you can see how the, the execution time is different. So this is using, this is essentially the speed up curve when you use the minimum speed and the maximum speed um, on the 10 runs of each node. So the execution time is reasonably reliable, not perfectly, um, and the average speed up is not quite linear, but, uh, but pretty near linear. And most importantly, there are zero failures. And so every one of these jobs finished. seems to scale more slowly early on at what seem like pretty large numbers of nodes. It was some effect. Uh, just having overhead for for things like speculative execution or is it? it it's, it's, I, I don't know exactly why. I, I think that there can be pretty funny things that happen in a cluster because you have these different racks and communication amongst the racks can be faster than communication across the racks. And um, at some levels, uh, maybe maybe you end up being forced to schedule just across the rack and then you don't get very much speed up for a while, but then you start getting some linear speed up. But, but then there's also caching effects which come into play because even though you're writing things to a cache file, the OS actually caches the file under RAM. 
and then if it happens to fit into RAM, which becomes more and more true as you come up here, then things go a little bit faster. Is there another question? Oh, I was just curious how many runs um, you did at uh, Ace. Well, how many how many points did you sample for the the product? I was wondering if that was the source of the nonlinearity. I should say it was a relatively small number of, of runs sampled. Yeah, so it is only 10 runs at each data point, so it, it could be just sampling here. It's, it's quite possible. So you said this is an isolated cluster, or? No, this is a, this is a development cluster. I'm, so surpri I'm surprised you don't see that your variance of your max, your green, well, I think you flipped the green and the blue, right? Or so it's speed, speed up, so that your blue line isn't dropping <coughs> more than it's so your sort of your coefficient of variation is decreasing as you're increasing the number of nodes. Right? You're not getting extra slowdown due to failures or oh you said there were no failures. There were no failures. Right. No failures. Well, also, uh, there's also no failures. No hold on a moment. I didn't say there were no failures of individual jobs. There were no, no failures of the global. No job. global job failures. Right. Right. So I, I, I would naively guess that if there's a, there's a uniform probability of the of a local job failing, then by adding more nodes, you're going to increase the variance. You're going to see more of those failures, and your variance will increase. So your blue line should drop more, but it doesn't. Any idea what's going on there? It's because the execution can help now better, because you have more jobs. Actually, the truth is, for this graph, we had we did not have the expected execution in the okay. time we did these experiments. So, with respect to execution, it gets better. Um, as far as why there's less variance here, the green one I get, right? Not so clear. Yeah. Uh, it, it could be just you know we only had ten samples at each point, and there's not very many samples. Okay, so then we also, um, you, you can also worry about when you switch from online to LBFGS, right? So this is using a uh, DNA data set, which is one of the larger publicly available data sets. The goal here is flight site recognition. Um, so you can do online learning for a single pass, and you get to this is area under the position recall curve, so higher is better. Um, it seems like these metrics are kind of crazy because people just like they go with some metric uh, which kind of makes sense to them, and then that metric is carried over forever in all future experiments. Uh, anyways, you can keep doing online learning when you keep averaging the parameters over and over again, and you get better and better and better. Or you can switch to using LBFGS, and then LBFGS can uh, improve things pretty quickly. Or you can, maybe you can switch over here. Uh, this is at five passes. Or you can just use LBFGS from the start. Okay, so what we see here is that online learning is getting better and better and better, and still getting better out here, but the the increment of improvement is not that great. Uh, you can see that LBFGS is just terrible for the first ten iterations, and it only starts to really kick in around twenty iterations, and then it gets better and better and better. It's still getting a little bit better up here, but it's not not yet. It's good. Yes? Any idea what happened around iteration 18 or 19? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know exactly what happened. But the thing to understand is that LBFGS is only an, an approximation to the end recession. Uh, and that means that sometimes it goes wrong. So the LBFGS built into VW is very aggressive about stepping um, every time it passes through the data. So for many traditional LBFGS applications, is you do a line search to figure out exactly how far you should step in the direction that LBF just tells you to step. But every every point in that line search requires passing through all the data. So we have uh, so it's kind of a merged line search and step process that goes on in BW. What happens is you you get your approximation of the inverse session, and then you use that to figure out how far to step, and then you just step. Uh, and then what happens is that the next time you pass through the data, you compute your loss as well as your gradients. And if your loss goes up, then you back step half the distance. And, uh, and then 
uh, and then you, but if your loss goes down, then you, you compute your new inverse approximation to the Hessian and then you step again. So is the loss function always too complex to use something derivative free like Melder Mead or? I don't know Melder Mead, so I don't really know. By the way, um, optimization was the one class that I've discovered that I really wished I'd taken in the grad school. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Uh, I didn't know LDFGS. Uh, somebody pointed it to me and I was like, hmm, that's interesting. So definitely optimization is pretty cool. Um, Read up on your nest off. What's that? Read up on your nest off. Well, maybe nest off too. Okay, so uh, I guess what I'm saying is LDFPS <coughs> is getting better, but it's not quite there. If you do online for one and then LDFGS then pretty quickly you get up to essentially maximal performance. This is a test that performance here. And sometimes things go wrong, you step the wrong direction, but then you back step and you repair whatever mistake was made. Um, <clears throat> and you can also start five passes and it's pretty similar, but it seems like one pass is really getting most of the juice out of online learning. It's just if you look up to about iteration, I don't know, 15 or is it 20? I'm not sure where it falls off, but right about there, if it weren't for that bump, you'd just to declare a winner right there and save on some, and save on a few runs. Yeah, I think, I mean, if you happen to stop right up here with early stopping, I think that, that you'd be quite happy with that solution. Okay, so this is um, splice size recognition. This is, uh, there's other data sets we saw, like the, on the, the, the click data set, where it seemed like online learning was much more powerful. So online learning would just essentially nail things after maybe five passes. But you can still switch over to LDFGS and also do five passes there. That seems like that's about equivalent. Okay, you can also t compare with other algorithms. Um, the Zinkovich algorithm, the idea here is that you, you create an overcomplete partition of the data. So each individual example appears on one quarter of the nodes. Right? And then, uh, then you train. And here, this, this, is, this is the effective number of patterns. So this is the degree of replication of individual examples in your data set. So then you train each individual thing up alone, and then, uh, and then you average the results at the end. So you only do one out of average. Um, and then this is uh, taken from Deckel. Um, you know my colleagues. Marty was at Yahoo, and Hofer is now at Microsoft. Um, so, anyways, the, the idea here is that you're doing uh, online mini batch, <coughs> and the um, yeah, so the mini batch typically a conversions rate is potentially slower, and that means that uh, you know it, it takes a long time to get a good solution. Uh, the other thing that, that is going to be important is that the, the communication complexity of this, that point there was 40,000 node hours. That was, was a very difficult point to get. Um, because after every mini batch, you need to synchronize your weights, or synchronize your gradients. Um, and that's a pretty painful thing to do. Uh, this one is, is easier, but it's still not as easy as that one computationally. Um, because you need to create that overcomplete partition, and that's not the, net, the resting state of your data. By splice sites, was the goal to find the amino acid pairs where genes begin and end, or? Um, you're asking what the actual problem was. Sorry. Um, so in Munchausen and Bullman, it's, uh, the idea was to actually predict where the uh, where the individual pieces of the gene were summed together. And you're supposed to be able to do it based on motifs, but it turns out that doesn't always work right. That's one of the nastiest data sets imaginable to test because it turns out that in a given tel cell type, you can be wrong and still get the same, you can still get the same answers that, uh, that they got to demonstrate that the group class that worked well. But I mean, it's a nasty, nasty data set to actually test something on. This is an amazing result. What do you say? Just point six the uh, rate at which you're getting it right. Like, 
60% of the time are getting the splice site right? This is area under the position retail curve. Uh, so you have position, you have recall, you have curve, you got the area under the What does that mean? I don't have a good intuition, actually. Uh, that was good. Uh, the numbers that we got here were better than, the, or maybe the same measure epsilon better than the numbers in the papers that we uh, that were using the data set previously. This, this, this was version six, um, and, and what we had to work was, was nice. Uh, something else that I've been trying to do for a long time, which is get to the point where I could do learning reductions. So this is a different subject. Now we're switching. We're going to talk about learning reductions for a few minutes. Uh, so the idea with learning reductions is that you have some complex problem, and you want to transform it into a simple problem so that you can use your, your base learning algorithm for the simple problem, and then you can transform it back. Um, and the, the most canonical example of this is, is one against all prediction, right? So you're trying to do multi-class, you have a binary classifier, and you're like, what do I do? Well, what you can do is you can create uh, k different classifiers, each of which predicts whether it's uh, this label or not, right? or whether it's label i or not. Uh, okay, so now, in terms of the way it's implemented in VW, uh, it's basically the magic of function pointers. Um, so you have, you, you need to have some sort of parser for the flags related to a particular reduction. And then you need to have a learn function for that particular reduction. That learn function takes an example's input. And then there's also a base learning algorithm, which you reset, but which you store so that you can call it, which you shove examples into. Okay, so now, now, when you're writing the code, this is pretty natural because what happens is uh, you wait until you get an example. So when, when the function is invoked, it has an example. And now you essentially want to implement uh, the R, which takes the example that you get and transforms it into perhaps a sequence of, of simpler examples. Um, and then, uh, and then you call the base learning algorithm on those simple examples. And then the, the, the process of parsing the arguments is essentially a process of compiling a stack of transformations, which, uh, which gives you your overall learning algorithm. Okay, so this is, this is, so when I was first thinking about learning reductions, I was thinking about things like learning install and, and more, um, more complex variants of this. But in fact, the, the as far as the code is concerned, this is very helpful for a lot of other things you might want to do. Like for individual uh, tasks, um, you might want to screw with your features in some way. Um, you may, might want to create ingrams, or you might want to 
do some sort of equidensity binning or, or something else, right? So you can do that um, via this mechanism. Anything where you get an example's input, you screw with the features, and then you call the base learning algorithm is fine. Uh, and then the other thing that's really important is that you inherit all of the input mechanisms, all the output mechanisms, all the optimization mechanisms. So you still do online, the adaptive, safe, normalized online gradient descent. You can still do the LBFTS, and you can still do the parallelization that I was just talking about. Okay, so now let me. I don't think I have time to really discuss the reductions in more detail, but there's a multi-class, there's two multi-class reductions right now, there's one against all, and there's air printing tournaments. And the thing which is interesting with air printing tournaments is that they're order log k in execution time. So you can potentially have a very large number of classes. Experimentally, we found that for text-like data sets where you have strong individual features, this works pretty well. For, um, for vision-type data sets, where all of your individual features are weak, it doesn't work as well as you would hope. So the one you install gives you better performance in terms of prediction. Um, so trying to figure out how to get the best of both is something that I'm interested in right now. Sorry, but those two, what works well? The so text style data sets? Yes. So in, in, in text data sets, that means individual words can be very strong indicators of the category of class. And then, uh, then we found this works pretty well. Oh, okay. It's using to the same prediction performance as, as it would against all. Okay. But for uh, vision type data sets, where individual features are like related to pixels and so not very strong, um, it's not as, you, you win on the computation and you lose on prediction performance. So there's a trade off. Okay, there's also cost sensitive learning. In cost sensitive learning, each individual class has, has a different uh, cost associated with it. And you know this cost of training time, but not at test time. <clears throat> so this constant version of one against all is also weighted all pairs. Uh, both of these are order k, and the, the difference between these two is just that uh, weighted all pairs is a, is a discriminative predictor. Uh, so sometimes it's a little bit more robust or doesn't use the representation complexity as much as is required for constant one against all. It's also label dependent versions of these. Often when you're dealing with multi-class classification, each individual, you want each individual class to have different features. And there's a mechanism in VW now to let you do that. Essentially what happens is a, an example becomes several lines separated by an empty line, with each line corresponding to an individual class label. Uh, and then there's contextual banded learning. So this is, this is something I talked about last time when I was here. So the idea here is that you're, you're learning from user feedback and you only get feedback about the action that you actually take, right? So you display a news story, and maybe it's clicked on in red. And now you notice it's clicked on, and so you say, oh, that's good. And now I want to optimize my predictor so that I will be, um, I'll be choosing the news stories which people actually want to read, right? So that's a different kind of label information than you, you get um, in standard supervised learning. People sometimes try to, um, try to think of it as supervised learning by saying, oh, I'm going to predict the probability of a label, which is very common. Um, and that's what the direct method would do. Um, and then you take an argmax max over uh, on the predicted probability. But then there are better methods in many situations. So this method tends to be very biased. This method is unbiased, but it can have higher variance. And this method uh, is kind of a, a combination of the two, which often works better than either individual. So there's, there's a papers to read there. And then the last thing is structured prediction. So in VW we have structured prediction via the CERN algorithm. Um, and so for sequential prediction, this is easy, and there's an example in the test suite which shows you how to do this. For more complex structured prediction than sequential, you start writing your own little modules of code. But there's a, there's a defined interface for doing that. Yeah? Uh, how do you deal with the imbalanced data set? <clears throat> how do you deal with an imbalanced data set? Um, 
So it depends on what you're trying to do to a large extent, but if you're, if you're thinking about imbalanced binary data set? No, multi-class. Multi-class. Um, so the first thing that I would try is probably a one against all, and then also a, a, a logistic loss function. Okay. Um, how imbalanced are we thinking about? Like, uh, imagine there are three classes. One class is like uh, eighty percent. The other class is ten percent. Huge imbalance between the one class and the rest of classes. So eighty ten is not that imbalanced. Um, but it is, it's more like it's one in a hundred or one in a thousand. If you use the base network, you get always, you know, bias to our first class. Yeah. So, um, logistic is better at imbalanced data sets than square loss, typically. Uh, because logistic is sort of sensitive to the difference between 0.01 probability and zero probability. It's very sensitive to that. The square loss doesn't really care that much. Um, so, the first thing to try is always logistic of some sort. And these reductions, you can choose whichever loss function you want for the base predictor, as well as choosing the width you're going to reduce things. So you can you can pair logistic loss with the one against all or with weighted on pairs or, or with whatever. Yeah? Well, the question reminded me that one of the reasons people started playing with the propensity score weighting was for imbalanced cohorts and, and drawing estimates from those. Could, could, you, could you make that work with multi-class prediction as well? Uh, contextual bandit is multi-class by default, so you specify the number of classes. So why not use that if you have, imbalanced, if you have an imbalanced data set? Uh, the form of the information which you're feeding in here is different than what you'd be putting in uh, up here because you only get feedback about the actual action taken here. While uh, if you're doing multi-class prediction, you get, you're getting feedback that this is the right, right action and these, all of these are the wrong actions. So could you use like smoothing or a Huber estimator or something like that to swap in for the loss function rather than something like this in terms of making it more robust for uh, or something more re a representative rare event that actually should be weighted? So when you say Huber estimator, uh, so Huber loss is typically squared loss, but is, you're thinking about it's modifying a square loss. Bit. What's that? It's a redescending squared loss so you don't get killed by the extremes as badly. Uh, so clipping of squared loss, uh, clipping of, of the prediction range is already built into VW. Oh, okay. So, uh, yeah. If you want to get rid of it, then you have to change the min prediction, the max prediction, to not be the range of the labels. So even with clipping, I've found that logistic is often better for the misbalanced uh, data sets. Yeah? Um, I saw some other slide that were saying you leverage Hadoop streaming. You run this on top of cube string and then you build a tree, right? Um, how is this going to work with like yarn and, and RT? Is, um, is that a relevant question? So, so I'm assuming that I haven't actually played with the yarn module yet, okay. but I'm assuming that the streaming still works. Um, as long as that works, but, but uh, I, I expect that I expect it does work because it's a very useful thing, even yeah, yeah, yeah. independent of this. Yeah. And so the same kind of thing will work. Okay. With that said, though, I'm going to be talking to people at Cloudera in a couple of weeks, uh, and they're interested in getting machine learning working directly as a yarn job. Yeah, because I have no one seems to have ported their stuff. So that cluster is based on one of the to be yarn, which is what we can try. Yeah. Okay. But uh, streaming works, and it's like sort of, it's just like a vehicle for transporting VW on the nodes, right? And then, and then they set up a tree. <coughs> Once they're there, they set up their own tree, and they yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Like so the code of sets up its own tree entirely. <coughs> yeah, yeah, it, it, I guess I, I was always annoyed when I would install programs and it depend upon eight thousand different things. Yeah. So I avoided that. <coughs> cool. All right. 
So, um, thank you. Yeah, I guess you guys can come and chat with John. Uh, he'll be here for a bit until some people need to run, so that's why we are going to see.